a decorated veteran, dies in his sleep. He's in very poor health. The coroner found it to be a natural death. But not everyone agrees this case is closed. Why is she coming forward now? <laughs> we have reason to question her motive. We're really up in the air as to what exactly happened. There's only one way for Lieutenant Joe Kenda to uncover the truth.
is a very routine call referred to as a DV, meaning a dead body. Patrol respond and they discover it is disheveled, it is filthy. They find an old man lying in basically a hospital bed, urine bags hanging all around him. His glasses and dentures are on a table next to the bed. He is reposed in a perfectly relaxed position. Looks like he basically just died in his bed there. When you arrive on the scene, the primary responsibility of the officer is to document the scene as to what he observed. Is this a crime scene that we're looking at, or is this... See this bruise here. Evidence of trauma on the body, incised wounds, meaning stab wounds, gunshot wounds, marks, bruising. No wounds except for there's a little scratch on his neck. No signs of trauma to the body, no real clear-cut cause of death. I don't see any sign of a suicide, though. I'm going to check the doors. Okay. Doesn't look like there was any forced entry into the apartment. Uh, there was no struggle that could be determined in there. No signs of a break. Okay. All right, I'm going to call the coroner. With no signs of foul play, standard protocol is to contact the coroner's office, not the major crimes unit. Once all parties are satisfied that criminal activity is not likely to be relevant, the body's brought back to the coroner's office and, and then prepared for autopsy. The decedent in this case is found in a hospital-type bed with rails on it. Now, he's known to be quite ill. He's got a very fatty liver. He also had significant heart disease. So this is undoubtedly a guy who was very sick and, and had a lot of medical problems. Hardening of the kidneys, advanced heart disease, Take your pick as to which one is fatal. Well, this guy's a mess. The coroner is the one who's ultimately responsible to identify the cause of death. In this case, he's called a natural causes medical. The reason Kenda had never heard of Orville Head is simple. Neither the coroner nor the responding officers believed Mr. Head had been murdered. We're in the criminal homicide business, not natural death. After reading the autopsy, Kenda begins to wonder about Kay Conway and her claim that Orville Head was murdered. Is Kay Conway insane? I had an old lady who would take a city bus to the police building every time she read about a murder in the paper to offer her confession. She was just lonely. Nobody would talk to her, but we would. Is Kay Conway one of those? Just to be safe, Kenda decides to contact Kay Conway himself. I would never reopen a death case unless I had overwhelming evidence or belief that this was, in fact, something other than a natural death. What was Conway? What is Lieutenant Kenda calling? Come talk to me, Miss Conway, and tell me why you said what you said. That evening, Kay Conway comes in for questioning. Please have a seat. She is, at this point, nothing more than a reporting witness. We treat her that way. Ms. Conway, I understand there's something to tell us. We're not going to dance. We're going to be extremely direct. Ms. Con I knew that Orville Head was murdered. It was my boyfriend, Paul Swanson. Really? How exactly would you know this? Because he told me he did. You're saying he confessed? Yes. This is something way beyond the big accusation. She's making a direct accusation against a named individual, saying he confessed to killing Orville Head. No longer matters how busy we are. We just got a little busy. Suddenly, a woman appears out of nowhere to announce that some man was murdered five months ago by her boyfriend. But the coroner found it to be a natural death, trying to investigate a case backwards. Extremely difficult to do. So you're saying that Paul Swanson murdered Orville Head, and he confessed it to you? Yes. All right, let's start at the beginning. How do you know Orville Head? Miss Conway says she's known Orville for some time. Her boyfriend, Paul Swanson, knows him as well. And her boyfriend drinks quite often at Orville Head's 
so do many others that frequent this place. Orville opened up his door to anybody who might want to come in and drink with him. Good. You choking on her. He was more than happy to welcome him in. Five months ago, Paul went over to Orville's house one night. But he didn't come home. The next day, I got up and I went to work. When I got home from work, Paul was finally home. And he was stone cold drunk. You were gone all night. Where were you? Orville's dead. What are you talking about? What happened? His death is because I strangled him. Why? Because you didn't like him. That was an alarm bell for me. I killed them because you, a third person, didn't like him. Makes no sense at all. I'm beginning to question Conway's truthfulness at that moment. And then what happened? He let me go. The bizarre motive Kay has laid out isn't the only issue Kenda has with her statement. The fact that she waited five months to make it also gives him pause. Obviously, we want to know why Kay's delayed in telling us this information. And why didn't she report it right then? Because I'm afraid of him. He gets so angry about everything. And then he hurts me. I didn't know what to do. When you're in an abusive situation like that, you'd be scared out of your... After this afternoon, that was the last straw. I am done with him. Miss Conlon, I understand that you're pressing charges. So you won't have to worry about him for a while. He's going to be in lockup for at least a couple of days. Thank goodness. Thank you for coming in. Make sure an officer sees that you get home. The information that Kate provides us this time does bring into question the actual death of Orville Head. But her information alone is not enough to make an arrest. So what do you think? Not sure? I have my reservations about Kate Conway. Could it be true? Of course it could. Is it true? I don't know. Kate Conway has a reason to get Mr. Swanson in a jam. He's been abusing her. He's recently done it again. No! 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 You have to look at, is she trying to pin it on Paul because she wants to get rid of him or have vengeance or whatever? Come down for a murder rap, but certainly get him out of her life. Yep. For a long time. I want to think she would make something like this up, but who knows? But one crucial piece of the puzzle is still missing. The only thing that's going to tell us if this is in fact a homicide is our old head's remains. And he's been in the ground for five months. We need to re-examine the body of Orville Head. The letter of the law says I have an absolute legal right as the commander of the homicide unit to demand the removal of a body from a grave to determine the manner of death. But a judge is not going to issue that order without somebody in the family saying it's okay. The following morning, detectives pay a visit to Orville Head's closest living relative, his brother Mr. Head, Lieutenant Kenneth, this is Detective Ritz uh, from Colorado Springs Police Department. Uh, we're here because we may have some information about the death of your brother, Orville. What's going on? Well, first off, can you tell us a little bit about Orville? He was a good man. He, a little rough around the edges, just because he was a loving neck, through and through. Orville Head was an American hero. He was a Marine who fought in World War II. He had actually been wounded in battle and received a Purple Heart and had received a Medal for Bravery. After the war, Orville settled into a career in the civil service. But inside, the battle raged on. Jack goes on to say that Orville suffered from PTSD from combat with the Japanese. And he never got over that and he self-medicated his problem with alcohol. And he goes from being part of the generation to be the person who has terrible medical problems and is not. It wouldn't be a big surprise. Mr. Head, I'm, I'm sorry to say that the information that we've received is that it's possible your brother may not have died of natural causes. What do you mean? Uh, well, he may have been murdered, and I hate to say it, but in order for us to be absolutely sure, we're going to need to examine the body. Now, this is a very bad and difficult thing to do to a family member. We put it in as nicely as we can, but bottom line, that's what we want. I don't know. I mean, is this really necessary? I'm afraid it is. It's the only way we're going to know for sure. Nobody wants.
wants to exhume a body, but if it means solving a crime and letting this person be at rest because it is solved, then it's worthwhile. Okay. Jack ultimately decides that it is important to know whether Orville just died or somebody did kill him. No, we appreciate it. I'll make sure I keep you on the way. So he expressly permits a judge to issue the exclamation or to determine the truthfulness of the accusation. The following afternoon, a recovery team is sent to exhume Orville's coffin from the grave. But Kendra bristles at the idea of raising the dead. Death is not supposed to be a scientific experiment of being dug up from a grave and probed by a doctor. You're supposed to finally be free of this world and all the various things with it. Another concern is whether Orville's remains will offer any further clues about the true cause of death. cases where in just a few months the, the bodies will begin to decompose water had seeped into the casket and there wasn't much left to examine the fact is we don't know what we're going to find when we bring this body out of the grave the dead cannot speak we have to speak for them and things like that can still uh, grow, mold can grow on the body, uh, which can cover it. And uh, there may be some continued progress through the, the post-mortem stages. But if an embalming is done correctly, generally speaking, they look recognizable as the person you knew them to be. In this particular case, that was true. So what are we looking for? Uh, we may have been strangled, but uh, we'll know for sure. definitely broken. There's some damage to the thyroid cartilage as well. So what do you think? There's no question. It's definitely a strangulation. So Kay Conway is correct about one thing completely. It is in fact a murder. The possibility that Orville had been strangled could have easily been overlooked in the first autopsy. No one was thinking murder. Orville was so far gone from his other problems that no one ever thought to look at his neck. With cause of death determined, Kenda turns back to the question of who's responsible. Did Paul Swanson in fact strangle Orville Head and confess that to Kay Conway like she claims? Or did someone we don't know about strangle Orville Head, told Kay Conway about it, and she sees an opportunity to rid herself of an abusive boyfriend? So where is Paul Swanson? Well, he's Mr. Swanson, it's only been a day or two since he was arrested. I'm going to tell you. Swanson believes, of course, he's going to be questioned about assaulting Kay Conway. Do you agree? 
wakes up the next morning, he sees that Orville is not awake. Orville! Orville! Orville, wake up, man! Orville, wake up, man! Come on! He starts to become alarmed that there's something really wrong because he's cold to the touch. He picks up Orville's phone and it doesn't work. So now he's a little panicked. Damn it! And he says he goes over to the local bar trying to get the police notified. Call 911. Call 911. What's going on? It's horrible. He's not breathing. So we now know Mr. Swanson, by his own admission, was in Orval Head's room the night before his death. What do you think killed him? I mean, he was an old man. He, he had a bad heart. You know, he, he was really sick. You know, he, he could hardly get around. Here's the thing. We just dug up Orval's body. Turns out he was murdered. And he was the last person to see him alive. He was murdered? Jesus. Listen, I would, I would never hurt Orville. I'm gay. It's clear that Paul Swanson had the means and opportunity to murder Orville Head, but a potential motive is far murkier. I cannot determine why Paul Swanson would have suddenly risen up and strangled Orville Head. All I have at this point is an accusation by Kay Conway that he confessed his crime to her, and that's not enough. Who's telling the truth here? Is Kate just trying to pin this on Paul because she wants to get rid of him? Or is Paul telling the truth that it was just a simple night of drinking and when he came home, Orville was dead? They will want to know more about their history and help us determine which one is truthful and which one is lying. Who can tell us about that? The most likely candidates are the neighbors. There's always a neighbor and a group of neighbors who'd make it their business to know everybody else's business. Kenda learns that in this case, that person is one Ann Ives. Uh, hello, Ms. Ives. Uh, I'm Lieutenant Kenda from the Colorado Springs Police Department. I was told that you could tell me about Paul and Kate. Those two, nothing but trouble. The police are always over here, breaking up a fight between them. A couple of drunks is what they are. She goes on to say that the most violent encounter between the two that she's aware of occurred just a short time ago in their front yard. Leave me alone, Paul! Get back in the house! No. You're causing no. a scene! Don't no. me! Girl, you're working my nerves! No. Get in the house! Don't. Come on! I don't want to go back inside with you! They go back inside their home, but Anne finds a bloody knife in her yard. 
enough is enough, she says, and calls the police. Ann says that when the police responded, they discovered Paul was the one who was actually injured. See, look at what she did, man. Wait. See my, see my keep, arm? Just keep fighting. Swanson has a cut on his forearm. He says to the officers that Kay Conway cut his arm with a kitchen knife. He had the knife, and he did that on his own. Why would I Stop. do this on my own? Stop. Ann Ives' statement casts further doubt over Kay Conway's claim that Paul was always the aggressor in their domestic disputes. Who called the police? Not Mr. Swanson. Not Miss Conway. The neighbor called the police without their knowledge. So when you're looking at that in this Orville Head investigation, you're saying, was Kate lying to us about Paul cutting himself, and is she lying now? I'm not sure yet, but I'm going to find out. extremely unorthodox backwards homicide investigation finds out the woman who's telling us that her boyfriend did it has some serious credibility issues. After speaking with the neighbors of Kay Conway and Paul Swanson, the case's sole potential suspects, Kenda's next move is to interview folks who lived in the same apartment complex as Orville Head. But here, the five months that have passed since Orville's death might as well have been five years. People ran up on a monthly basis. It was that kind of complex. So there wasn't people there other than Orville who stayed there on, on a long-term basis. To find a neighbor who lived directly next door to Orville Head. Excuse me, sir. I'm Lieutenant Ken of the Suspected Blitz, uh, Colorado Springs Police Department. All right. Yes, yeah, Do you recall an Orville Head that uh, passed away about five months ago? Yeah, of course. Mr. Sykes, we're investigating his death as a possible homicide. Do you think of anyone that might have wanted to harm him? No. No one comes to mind. But, uh, you no, know, he was a hothead. Always yelling and screaming all the time. And he was always having people over for drinks. Were these friends of his, then? No. Some of them were. Some of them, I think, was just there for the free boots. But also invite strangers. How about you just sit back and shut up? Who Mr. Sykes described as unsavory characters who would come in and share in his whispering. A lot of them were actually taking advantage of Orville's generosity. Orville had the alcohol, these people wanted it, so they would do it and maybe even prey on Orville a little bit. But the night he actually died, do you remember anything special about that? Actually, I do. Get out of it! Get out of it! Get the hell out of it! They didn't know who it was, but just knew that somebody was in there. And Orville was yelling at them to get in his apartment. Well, I didn't think much about it at the time. I mean, Orville was always yelling. <laughs> and then, uh, well, you know, the next day I heard he had a heart attack and died. Dan Sykes prompts Kenda to think back on Paul Swanson's statement that he and Orville weren't drinking alone that night. I understand there's another guy in the building that used to drink with Orville, too. Uh, Hispanic guy. Oh, yeah. That'd be Martin Ramirez. One of the few doors down. That guy. You know, picnic. He describes Ramirez as kind of a head case who's easily angered and set off. So you couple that statement with head yelling at somebody that night. Was it Ramirez? Mr. Ramirez, I'd like to ask you a few questions about Warble Head. Warble? He's been dead a while now. That's right, he has. Might have to come in. He says he remembers that night because of the fact that Orville was found dead the next morning. So you were there the night Orville died. Can you tell us what happened? Oh, so. One night. How did you stay? About 10 or so. I had to get up for work the next morning, so I went home to bed. Ramirez vehemently denies returning to Orville Head's house any time after 10 o'clock that evening. He says he was drunk, he went to bed, he got up and went to work. But is Martin Ramirez Telling the truth about the night of the murder, it's a question Kenda still can't answer. Well, thank you for your time. We'll be in touch. At this point, we need to find somebody who is close to Orwell, somebody that is more knowledgeable than what we've uncovered so far. But we go back to Orwell's brother. Hello, Jack. It's your Kenda here. How you doing? Yeah, I got some more questions about Orwell. So we asked Jack who was a really good friend of his who would know 
for them to be where we've met so far. Jack says the guy we want to speak to is an old neighbor of Orville's whose name is Lester Geist. Lester Geis was a good friend of Orville's. He used to live next door to him. He was somebody who looked out for him. Jack says he has a cup of coffee at the Robin Hood Bar every morning, and I'm sure you can find him there tomorrow morning. Lester Geist? Yes. Oh, Dr. Kenner. Dr. Fritz. So we explained to Lester Geist that we are investigating the death of Orville Head now as a homicide. What? you got to be kidding me. If there's a trouble, he would have knocked. I would have come right over. Wait a minute. What do you mean he would have knocked? Lester said they had a system worked out. If Orville was having an issue with someone or something, he would knock on the wall and Lester would come to his aid. You know, I was totally shocked when Paul came running in here that morning and then we saw Orville just laying there. Wait, you saw the body. Lester is never mentioned in that limited first report. No one ever knew that Lester Geist exists. But having seen Orville Head shortly after his death, Lester Geist is Kenda's window into the crime scene. What did he see that was different? That's what we wanted to know. Did you notice anything out of place while you were there? Oral? Oral, oh, buddy. Lester thought for a minute and said, you know what? I did. I noticed that the telephone was unplugged. What? From the phone itself, which was unusual. So why is the phone unplugged? I immediately returned to my conversation with Paul Swanson, who he said he tried to use the phone and it didn't work. Well, how would you not notice it wasn't plugged in, Mr. Swanson? Do you know Paul Swanson? Did you ever seen him before he came running into the bar? Yeah, let me tell you, that guy's got problems. He's a binger, an alcoholic. But he also goes a little step further and says that he has a tendency to get violent. Kill Horn? Not in the slightest. Now, violent, drunk, and dangerous is a good combination in the murder business. Given what Lester Geist has told them, Kenda wonders if Kay Conway's initial statement may have, in fact, been true. But even if Kay was telling the truth, it's not enough to arrest Paul Swanson for murder. You can't just use one person's statement against somebody else uh, to turn them with homicide. All right, Mr. Geist, uh, thank you for your time. Let me know if I can do anything else for you guys. Appreciate that. Back at the office, Kenda and Ritz are greeted with some explosive news. I'm informed there's a woman waiting to see me whose name is Minion Wallace, who says she has information on the Orville Head case. I really appreciate you coming in. I've been really scared by all this. And when I heard that Orville was murdered, I felt that I had to come speak with you. Okay. I know who killed him. And I'm thinking, wonderful, Minion. You could be precisely who I've been looking for without realizing it was you. I believe I'm on the edge of solving this case of knowing who killed Marvel Head. Minion Wallace is an elderly lady. She seems very frightened. But now that she's heard and knows that Orville was really murdered, she had to come forward with this information she has for me. It was Paul Swanson. He's the one who killed Orville. Minion Wallace goes on to say that she knows Orville Head. She also knows Paul Swanson. She treats Swanson like her nephew. Known him a long time. The night Orville died, she was receiving phone calls from Paul Swanson. He phoned me, and I could hear Orville in the background. When she said that, I immediately think Paul Swanson is the same guy that told me the phone didn't work. Now I know Paul Swanson lied to me. Why do you lie to the police? Self-protection. That's why. So, Paul, did you unplug the phone and then you killed Orville? I didn't think much of it until the next morning. Paul came over, and he told me that he had killed Orville. Paul, good morning. What happened? I messed up, didn't you? Uh, <laughs> Orville. Orville's dead. I needed a person to confirm what Conway told me as the truth, and I just found it. I don't know what to do. I don't know who to call, who to talk to. Paul Swanson is... 
idea why they did something they just did, but they do things all the time they can't recall. And why didn't you come forward then? Everyone said that Orville died of natural causes, and I pray that that was true and that Paul had just imagined it. And I did not want to tangle with Paul. But just like Kay didn't come forward right away when she was told by Paul that he had killed Orville. Minion was afraid of Paul. She knew he was capable of harming people. If he finds out, I'm here. And I said to her, Miss Wallace, I can assure you that he's not going to be in a position to hurt you because he's going to be in prison because I'm going to put him there. We have two witnesses who are willing to testify that Paul came forward to them and confessed to the crime. We're starting to build enough probable cause to make an arrest in this case. So now I get to go back and arrange for Mr. Swanson to be brought over from the county jail, placed in an interrogation room. So, Paul, we've had some interesting conversations with people who seem to know you pretty well. I don't want So I have some more questions. I'm not saying anything without my lawyer. So you've invoked your right to remain silent? Yes. Fine, Mr. Swanson. You certainly may remain silent. So now what? Now? Well, now you're under arrest for murder. Officer! We then took our case to the El Paso County District Attorney's Office. They direct filed charges of second-degree murder against Mr. Swanson. Although Paul Swanson has lawyered up, Kenda believes he can piece together what happened the night Orville Head was murdered. All right, where's the secret stash, man? Just go finish the cigarettes. Where are you doing, man? What if I am? Fresh out of booze, man. Oh! What you got over there? What you holding back from me? I see that. I'll get you on. Come on, Cheryl, man. Hey. Run the wild. So, Paul Swanson, why did he ultimately do this? This is mine. Get some more tomorrow, man. Think about Swanson's personality. Share it, man. Get, get some of me, man. He drinks to excess. When he's drunk, he becomes violent. Get the hell out of here. Call the cops. Like hell you are. He unplugs the phone so Orville can't call for help. Swanson's rage rises, and he reacts by grabbing him by the throat. And strangles Orville until he's not breathing anymore. It would be like strangling a child. Head is in no condition to defend himself. is what he's done. That Orville's dead. He didn't just assault him, he killed him. Kenda believes at that point, Paul Swanson staged the room to make it seem like Orville simply died in his sleep. And then we have to run across the street to the bar to try to get, you know, somebody to call 911. At trial, that same theory resonates with the jury. They find Paul Swanson guilty and sentence him to 40 years behind bars. Because people came forward, his death was able to be solved. Otherwise, it would have just fallen through the cracks and nobody would have given it a second thought. This is one of those cases I'm glad that didn't get away. Had Kay not come forward at this time, she probably could have been the next victim of Paul's. The darker question raised by this case, how many other natural deaths were actually murders. How many do we not know about? I have no idea. A knock at the door unleashes a night of terror. Get the door! Get your pockets! Go! 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 There's a lot more to this case than meets the eye. <laughs> Lieutenant Kenda knows that someone is hiding a shocking secret. What did they know? Could this be a catalyst for murder? Absolutely. <laughs> Humans are very interesting. They do what fear drives them to do. But fear leads to contempt Contempt leads to conspiracy, and conspiracy leads to murder. There's one thing that never changes, murder. 
a life has been taken. Their stories are now my stories. I never know where a case is going to lead, but I'll never stop until it's solved. Somebody has to look out for the victim. If you kill, I will find you. It's past midnight, and the roads are nearly deserted, as Pearl Duncan cruises down Nevada Avenue on the way to her friend Nora Evans' house. She's gonna have a drink with Nora. Typical night for them. Well, the first thing Pearl notices when she pulls up is the front door standing open. She has this feeling that something's not right. And as she gets closer to the house, Outruns a friend that she knows. Wait, how? Carla, what's going on? What's wrong? Something awful has clearly happened. Pearl goes in the house and she can't believe what she sees. The first thing she notices is Chad, Nora's son, laying on the floor. He's bleeding pretty bad from the chest. She's Nora, kneeling on the floor, holding her boyfriend William's head in her lap. Just a few miles away, Lieutenant Joe Kenda is battling another sleepless night. The hardest thing for me to do is to turn my mind off, think about all the things I've done, and all the things I've seen. It's gone. It cleared my head. And it's very, very beautiful. I would get lost in it. I knew what it was, and I knew I had a new case to work on. Within minutes, Kenda arrives at the scene on Nevada Avenue, where the night sky is awash in a flood of police lights. Hey, Lieutenant, you stand? That's what we got tonight. Two victims found inside the house with gunshot wounds. Both been transferred to a Memorial Hospital. The first victim is Chad Evans, a 21-year-old male who's been shot in the chest. He is in stable condition at a hospital. The second victim is William Davis. He's 29 years old. He's been shot in the back of the head, and he's in extremely critical condition. My paramedics don't think Mr. Davis will pull through. Do they live here? Uh, Nora Evans lives here with her son, Chad, and her boyfriend, William. The officers explained that Nora Evans and her friend Pearl followed the ambulance to the hospital. Her friend Pearl showed up after the event. She didn't see anything, but we have Mrs. Evans and an eyewitness, uh, Paul Murphy. He seemed pretty traumatized about the whole thing. While Ken is discussing the incident with a patrolman, Detective Terry Bjorndahl approaches him with a possible lead. One neighbor said that she had seen a red car possibly fleeing from the scene. Could be unrelated, but we put out an APB just in case. I walk into this residence and I see a bath towel that's blood soaked and I see an expended nine millimeter casing laying on the carpet. So obviously I'm in the right place. Check this out. What I see there that's so unusual is a bunch of electrical cords and are scattered around on the floor. Chad and William both were tied up. Apparently the other two witnesses were as well and should untie themselves. All this carried over into the back room down the hall. Let's take a look. It is extremely rare to find a crime scene where multiple victims have been shot and that they were tied up when they were shot. When I walk into the bedroom, the mattress is overturned. Closets are open. There were contents spilled everywhere. There was broken glass. These aren't messy residents. Somebody is searching for something that is concealed in this place. Seems like 
to handle with more than one person. Let's go. It's very obvious this is a robbery as well as a shooting, and the tying says that they're interrogated. So then the question is, what is it that these people are looking for? Hoping for some clarity, Kenda and Detective Bjorndal turn to the only witness still on the scene. Paul Murphy is the one that ran to a neighbor to call 911. He's young, just 20 years old. He's a soldier at Fort Carson. Uh, Mr. Murphy? Yes? I know you've been through a lot tonight. You need some help sorting this out? What were you doing here tonight? It's so weird. I wasn't even planning to be here. Paul Murphy explains that shortly before midnight, William Davis invited him over to his girlfriend Nora's house for an impromptu round of drinks. According to Paul, we're sitting around having a couple of cocktails, and Nora advised him that her friend Pearl's coming over. There's a knock at the door. He assumes that's going to be Pearl. Can you get that? That's probably her right there, man. We're gonna hook you up, all right? And he was just forced back into the home, onto the carpet. Paul explains that Nora's son Chad was also there at the time of the incident. And they tied them all up using electric cords that they find in the premise. Hey, I tied them up, man. Hey, Chad, it's all right, all right? How much money do we got, man? Oh, 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 that's it. That's it. That's it. Oh, 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 money at? Somebody goes down at night. They wanted that money, and they were going to get it. So two men start ransacking the house. And Paul becomes absolutely terrified and buries his face in the carpet. Can you describe these guys at all? No, I just kept my head in the floor. I, I, didn't, I didn't want them to see me, see them. He couldn't provide us with any suspect information. All right, well, that's all for me. Thanks for your time. It's going all the way, okay? Based on my own experience, this is not some random event. These guys did not arrive wearing masks and armed at Nora's house by accident. After speaking with Paul Murphy, Kenda heads to Memorial Hospital, hoping his two victims can shed some additional light on the incident. I'm told that William Davis is in surgery with a neuro... How are you feeling? Like garbage. What about William? Well, he's still in surgery now. We should know more soon. But in the meantime, I can really use your help. He says he's in bed. He hears yelling and screaming. He steps out into the living room and a gun immediately is shoved in his face. Chad's account was about the same as Paul's. How would you describe these guys? We cannot offer a description of the perpetrators. Even though he is present and is a victim of a shooting, he doesn't seem to know a great deal about anything. I'm going to let you rest. Thank you. After hitting a wall with Chad Evans, Kenda's next best shot at unraveling this mystery rests with the other injured victim. Davis. Hey, Joe. Hey, Tommy. I see the neurosurgeon, who I happen to know, come out of the operating room. Uh, one of my Vicks has been operating on, William Davis. How do you have any idea when I could talk to him? I hate to break it, seems he's been pronounced. So now we have a homicide. Uh, do you know if there's a Nora Evans here? Uh, yes, she's in here with a friend with a red shirt on. Yeah, thank you. I'm Lieutenant Kenneth from the police department. I know it's a difficult time. I just lost my boyfriend, and you're going to come in here and ask me questions? How dare you? She comes unstuck, jumps to her feet, yells at me. I just lost my man, and now you want to ask me questions? You know what? Screw you. Nora, wait. She storms off down the hall. This woman won't even speak to me, won't even come near me. I feel a cringe come over me that, oh my, when things go bad, they tend to stay bad. The following morning, Kenda rethinks his strategy. 
This whole case is falling apart before we even have a chance to even start. I'm trying to figure out where we're going to go with this. Pardon me, Lieutenant. I heard about the shooting over the radio, and I think I might have found a connection. A patrol officer named Michaels comes up and says Evans is an associate of a local street gang. And there's been some bad blood between the group he's affiliated with and another group in the area. About two weeks ago, I responded to a shots fired call near Nor Evans' house. The officer says a small red car could have been involved in the shots fired. Kenda wonders, could this be the same red car neighbors saw fleeing the scene? And he is a member of a rival street gang to Chad Evans and his group. Who's the owner of the red car? Melvin Small, 25 years old, lives on the southeast side. Great. How about you and I take a ride over there? Melvin Small, we know belongs to a street gang. It's not a major gang. But nonetheless, we are certainly prepared for the worst if it comes to that. Police Department. There's a few things I'd like to discuss with you. Uh, do you mind if we come in? Fine. While Officer Michael scans the house for signs of danger, Kenda gets right to the point with Melvin. So I tell him we're investigating a homicide, and your car may have been seen in that area. Happened last night. That wasn't me. So that wasn't your red car that people saw leave a chat out. Man, I don't know what people saw, but I'm telling you that wasn't me. I was in Denver yesterday. He's now pretty nervous. And I said, my friend, you better know who else you were with, and you better tell me that right now. All right. Give me some names and numbers of people who can verify that. Check out, sir. I sent Michaels out to a car to confirm this information. So 10 or 15 minutes later, he comes back inside and says, well, no one was truthful. Checks out. His friends are in Denver at a party. No one spent the night. So he's in Denver, Colorado, in his little red car, and not here, involved in homicide. With Melvin Small eliminated as a suspect, Kenda starts to rethink the case. If Chad Evans his alleged gang ties truly sparked the shooting, then why would he be the one who's still alive? Chad had a very minor wound, but William was obviously assassinated. It really leads investigators at this point to wonder if William is the target of the crime, and if so, why? The person in the best position to know about William is Nora Evans. I need to speak to her ultimately tracks down Nora at the home of her friend, Pearl Duncan. And I'm... Hey, Nora. It's the cop. Hi, Nora. I'm the center tender. Uh, I'm the last person I want to talk to. I'm right stop you. I'm sorry about the other night. Come in. She explained that she was just really angry that William lost his life. And I assured her that what's done is done. But I'm trying to help you. Can you help me? So, what do you want to know? How long have you known William? Uh, a while, actually. He, uh, and I went out for a while. She described him as somebody who was very caring and very loving. Uh, so William lived with you and your son? No, we need to stay with us sometimes. And he helped us pay the bills when we needed him to. She said that William didn't have a steady job, but uh, did a lot of part-time jobs here and there to help bring money into the house. I asked Nora could these people armed with guns and wearing masks possibly be looking for in your place? And you saw my place. I'm just scraping by. I don't know what they thought they were going to find. And what about William? Why were they turning him for money? He didn't have a lot of money, but what he did have, he had in cash. She advised that William liked to carry his money in a fanny pack uh, around his waist, and that during the robbery, the robbers did take that fanny pack with them when they left. Why were he carrying money in a fanny pack? William, you know. Honestly, I don't think he had a bank account. 
Do you know who might be responsible for this? Yeah, I do. You do? Absolutely. And Nora drops a bombshell. And she said, well, I think it was William's father. What? William's father shot him in the back of the head? Now, that's a new explanation of fatherly love that I've never heard. Nothing about nothing. 
Paul originally told me he was in the army and he hadn't seen William Davis in weeks. Who did this to Jan Warner? You have to have some idea. You hit your own brother. I know. Well, I was thinking, you know, maybe it was Shu. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I was with him the other night and he was talking about how William was disrespecting him. So we have a second person talking about Shu. Where we find Shu? He's at a house over there by those projects on the south side. Thank you. And Lisa, if you ever want to get clean, give me a call. Kenda's goal now is to speak with Paul Murphy and Fred Watson, a.k.a. Shu, as soon as possible. 20 minutes later, Kenda and his team arrive at the house where Shu is allegedly holed up. Police, open up! What are you doing at my house? A woman answers the door, and she's typically uncooperative. Ma'am, we're conducting a homicide investigation. We need to speak to a Fred Watson. We know that he stays here. You're out of your mind. You know Fred here. How about a shoe? Who's looking for shoe? Why don't you step out here? We can talk about it. So a guy steps forward. He's a tall, older guy. <sighs> well, what do you want to talk about? Can I help you with something? And I say, well, yeah, shoe. As a matter of fact, you can. Kenda and Bjorndal formulate a plan to 
bring their new prime suspect to heel. I traveled to Dee's home and set up surveillance. It's safe to his... Go for that. Your biggest fear is, once they know that you target them as a suspect, they may flee. We've got eyes on the suspect residence, and we've got a red car registered in his name out front. 10-4, stand by. With Dee Sutton's red vehicle parked in front of the house, the odds are he's at home. At that point, Kenda springs the trap. Hello? That's just Lieutenant Kenda with the Colorado Springs Police Department. I'd like to speak to a D. Sutton. Speaking? What can I do for you? I tell him I want him to come down to the police station to discuss an incident involving the death of William Davis. He says, well, I'll talk to you, but I'm not coming to the police station. There's a diner over on Cascade. All right, well, I know the place. I can be there in 30. Okay. Uh, see you there. Great, I'll see you there. But instead of rushing out to the diner to meet D. Sutton, Kenda stays put. We thought the safest way for... All parties was just to set up a standard stop with uh, uniformed patrol officers. Suspects on the move. Copy that. Scoop him out. So he leaves the house, and the officers let him get in his car. And I said, now stop him and bring him to me. The team's plan goes off without a hitch. D, thanks for stopping by. Have a seat. Oh, what happened? Got me where you wanted. You understand, right? Why is it important we talk? He begins to tell me a story. He says he doesn't know anything about William Davis' death. Well, what about William hooking up with your girlfriend? I'm sure you weren't too happy when you found out. He just blew that off. He said that, that wasn't a big deal. She was just something to do when there was nothing to do. But there is a note of anger in his voice and anger in his face. It was not a non-event to him. Listen, man. I didn't do it. But if I wanted to, I'd have to stand in line. Oh, yeah? Why is that? <laughs> he tells us that William has a lot of enemies, wants to rub people the wrong way. D described William as the kind of person that stepped on everybody. D has a point. I've drawn the same conclusions. Prime to William Davis. D Sutton may have the strongest motive of any of the possible suspects. But for Kenda, that's not enough proof he's the shooter. What evidence do I have against him? Zip. All right, you're free to go for now. Stay close to home. We have the finger pointing going on here between all these different people. I'm getting the feeling this is bigger than just our two shooters. There are other people involved. I can feel it. That's when Kenda decides to circle back to another person of interest, William's right-hand man, Paul Murphy. We have a victim who is a less than stellar member of the community. Who does he have that's loyal to him? His associate, Paul Murphy. He may have some information that can help us track these killers down. He's in the Army. So my initial thought is, well, he'll be easy to find. We call Fort Carson CID. Yes, this is Lieutenant Kenneth from Colorado Springs Police Department. I work on a homicide investigation, and I could use your help locating a soldier by the name of Paul Murphy. But Kenda's hopes are quickly dashed. You're kidding. I find this very crushing news that Paul Murphy was AWOL the whole time we were talking to him and has been discharged from the United States Army. They have no idea where he is. Okay, thanks for your time. Bye. Now what? Is Paul halfway to Mexico? Is Paul shot to death in a drainage ditch in eastern El Paso County? If I can't find Paul Murphy, I don't know if I'll be able to solve this case.
frustration. I've been lied to, shined on, given false suspects. I finally decide the key to this case is going to be William Davis's closest associate in crime, Paul Murphy. The problem is, I can't find him. With Paul Murphy AWOL from his post at Fort Carson, Kenda tries to track him down another way. We put the word out on the street to our informants in the drug world to say that it's really important we talk to Paul Murphy. Days go by without any leads. We have no addresses. We have no known other associates. Murphy remains in the wind. Finally, Kenda's luck changes. Someone's here to see you. Who is it? Paul Murphy just walked in. Really? Send him in. Yes, sir. Instead of us having to chase him, he has appeared out of nowhere. Perfect. Paul, close the door and have a seat. Paul looks as if he wants to get something off his chest. He is an emotional wreck. I know that you lied to me about your business relationship with William. I wasn't honest in the beginning because I was scared of what he might do. I need you to protect me. Protect you from who? Person who shot William. Decent. Well, that's the name I've heard before. Paul explains that two days before the murder, Nora Evans had a small get-together at her house, and the subject turned to William Davis. This guy's out of control. He cheated on you. With my chick, he's always disrespecting the shoot. He's pushing around Chad and Paul. Nora is present. Murphy is there. Dee Sutton is there. Chad Evans is there. They all agree that Davis treats everybody awfully. But what can we do about it? He's got all the money and the drugs. I'll tell you what we can do about it. This time, look. Put a gun in his face and take all his money. Rob him? You're out of your mind. Hey, we gotta take this guy down a notch. All right, fine. But don't hurt him, okay? Okay. They wanted to put him in his place. They wanted him to realize that he's not the big guy. And now it all makes sense. All of my witnesses were trying to cover their own tracks. Okay, so Dianora wanted revenge for him cheating and humiliating everyone. Wasn't it for you? Murphy says he's promised crack cocaine, which he's addicted to, and for a reason for a cut of the money they take. Paul claims that D. Sutton was the crime's mastermind. According to D, he would bring along a friend named Alonzo Hankins. The two of them would be the robbers, and everyone else needed to be present so William wouldn't suspect they were in on it. But we gotta make this look as real as possible. I need y'all on point. Paul tells Kenda that on the night of the murder, he stopped by Nora's house with William, just as Dee instructed. <laughs> when they arrive at Nora's house, Murphy slips away and uses his cell phone to call Dee Sutton. Still asserts he knows nothing about the drugs that Dee's demanding he fork over. Paul says 
decelerates is his boiling point. I can't see a bitch, too! He puts his gun directly in the back of William Davis's head. Come on, man, you gotta do that! Not so tough now. He pulls the trigger and puts a bullet into his brain. Hey, what the hell? Now, shooting is contagious. Alonzo Hankins doesn't know what's going on. So he shoots the guy he has control of, which is Chad Evans. <laughs> Stop, what you doing? Chad! Jesus, North, you okay? So we have two shots, one quickly following the other, one out of confusion and one with intent. Put your help! Murphy runs out for help. If Paul Murphy's statement is to be believed, then nearly every witness Kenda spoke with has been spinning a web of lies. That is incredible that everybody's a player. The only true victim here is William Davis, and he's dead. Thanks, Paul. We're at the book you for first degree murder. What? Oh. Lieutenant Kenda, can I have a booking officer at my office, please? Even though D is the one who pulled the trigger and killed William, everybody involved in setting up that robbery is guilty of a felony murder in the state of Colorado. Over the next few days, this team tracks down Nora Evans, her son Chad, D. Sutton, and Alonzo Hankins. They are each charged with first-degree murder. But even with all four of them in custody, Kenda knows that getting across-the-board convictions is far from a done deal. None of these people confess. Everybody either has a story of denial or no story. His trial goes first. The very first thing Paul Murphy does is withdraw his confession. Says he was lying when he said all that. Murphy's acquitted of all charges. And with that, the district attorney has no choice but to dismiss the charges against the remaining defendants. So Nora Evans, Chad Evans, Dee Sutton, and Alonzo Hankins walk away. It's a wildly unsatisfying conclusion to a bizarre case. This is the nature of homicide investigation. Your absolute best effort, weeks and months of work, comes to naught. Smoke in the air. Most people look at these cases of they got what they deserve. Nobody deserves that. No one. Do I disapprove of William Davis's life? Of course I do. Is he a criminal? Absolutely. But he's also the victim of a homicide. And nobody gets to play God. Simple enough.